There are 10 sites around the country, zooming right around the one over here. So that's us there, this is the Tokel site. We did a field day yesterday to, at the Korakai site, which is at the top. This is what came out of SIP1, fundamentals um, for good irrigation performance. Maintain your irrigation system to make sure it's working as it should. One of the things that doesn't happen a lot. Use water balance calculation tools such as Pasture, which we'll be mentioning a little bit today. Monitor your soil moisture, which we'll also be mentioning. And um, James will tell us some, some good information on that. Know the capacity of your system, uh, which is very important. It means know your system performance. And this one we won't be touching on much today, but it does create an ideal platform for strategic nitrogen use. We heard yesterday, if you can't irrigate well, you're going to have a lot of trouble getting good nitrogen efficiency. Very quick touch on, because James will mention this more, the basics of scheduling Irrigation scheduling is to keep the water in the soil profile at the optimum level. If it's full of water, like we've had with heavy rain, it's saturated, crop doesn't grow in that bit there, pasture doesn't grow. If it's way over here in wilting point, it means it's dry uh, and the crop is going to die. and It's not producing as it should. There's a nice sweet zone between what we call field capacity and refill point, RAW, readily available water. That's where you want to keep it. And can I also say, if you are an irrigator, the whole reason you're an irrigator is because you control refill point. All that money you're investing and everything, it's all so you can do, you control that. A dry land farmer has no control over refill point. An irrigation farmer has some control over field capacity as well, depending on whether the rain's on. That's what you're paying the big money for, so you can control the water in that range. Okay. This is uh, the objective of scheduling, and James will show the same graph and explain it more, so I won't, but that's what we want to avoid, a soil moisture probe line that looks like that, okay? In terms of our site here at Tokau, this is our, our reference group. We've got uh, Peter Williams, Christoph Doyle, Matt Nielsen, Matt Brett and Julia Wokes, who are all farmers on our reference group. Got Rob Elliott and Kyle Roper, who are both here today. I think I saw Kyle walk in somewhere. Yes, yeah. uh, who are service providers. And in terms of agency, we've got Peter Beale, Dave Dean, Carly, Rob Cooper, who's on uh, Dairy New South Wales, and also the stand-in uh, extension officer, uh, can't be here today. And Sheena Carter from New South Wales DPI, who's also with us. And this is what has happened. We've developed and refined questions that we want to investigate. We've done a pre-season check, Rob. Ellie did that for the system this season, just we're in the middle of now. We have discussed findings and on irrigation timing, production, etc., and made suggestions to Matt. Don't know whether he followed them or not, but we've made suggestions um, for him. And then uh, in, uh, some of the reference group have implemented these tools on their farm. Um, in particular, I want to say the Swan Systems uh, email, which I'll talk about shortly. And we've identified some issues of which. This is a key one, but unfortunately we haven't been able to do anything about it, but we've identified it as an issue to this point. These are our questions. Can improved scheduling of irrigation and nitrogen applications allow the pasture mix to actively persist into early summer? Will scheduling irrigation in response to soil moisture and, wa and water balance result in improved growth rates compared to the current approach, which is, was set irrigation? And if irrigation is based on the RAW, how will that affect the decision-making process? And we're sort of monitoring that with Matt as to how his decisions might change rather than just having a fixed program. And also what are the skills that are necessary for those in, um, that Matt might need to relay to his staff or might have any staff. And what are the gains? And of course, that's the big one. What are the gains in doing this? We hope we can get a handle on that. That's the layout. Um, we are about here somewhere, I think. Um, so here's one of the pivots. It's a small one. Here's another, a bigger one. And this is the biggest of them. So they're that away. And we'll have a quick look at them, hopefully at the farm walk. We won't, not going to go all the way along. We're just going to have a look from a height. So there's the three pivots. They're three different sizes, 19 hectare, 14 hectare, and four hectare, total of 37. Rye, chicory, maize, I should have put clover there, I think. Rye, chicory, clover, not maize, but maize is grown in a, 
at some times in some of the paddocks. And there's 680 odd megalitres of water available for this farm, which is pretty uh, generous, being a, an ag research type farm, it's pretty, pretty generous. We, as part of the RAW, soil texture makes a really big difference. So we got the texture classified. And this is at two sites under the four span pivot, one under each of the other two. And we came up with these texture classes, basically sandy loam to sandy clay loam, a nice middle of the range soil. And from that, we could calculate that readily available water range. Um, now those figures are quite important as you've already heard and James will mention a bit more about them. You need to know those figures if you're going to schedule well. We've also adjusted them a bit from the last two seasons using the tools we've got. We've been able to adjust those to be a little bit bigger and I think we'll probably end up doing that again um, as we get a bit more information. Such is the advantage of that. It gives you a good starting point and then you can refine it and get uh, better info. This is one of the tools, this is Iri Pasture, and it's a water balance tool, and from here you can see this is from the 1st of July 2019, so I'm showing you a very big range right up to just uh, February. Uh, that's effectively the water balance in the soil. Water inputs makes it go up, water usage by the crop makes it go down. The inputs are rain, which are those blue lines, and the irrigation, which are the red lines. You might remember the dreadful season at the end of 2019 when it was so hot. You can see there's irrigation, especially there happening heaps. And then the rain started in uh, the beginning of 2020 and so you can see lots of rainfall. And up and down she goes. In the main, it's in between the refill point, which is the red line, and fill capacity, which is the yellow line. We've got a few bits where it's dropped below. And we, with the rain and so on, we've had a few that have gone above. This is a free tool and it gives you that kind of indication. And we're looking for things where this change of slope occurs. Water is used very rapidly, then there's a change of slope about there. And we've got that a couple of times. That's why I think we might be able to adjust our readily available water. Free tool which extracts weather data from the Bureau of Met and calculates the crop water use, CTC. We're very ha uh, lucky here that we've got a Bureau of Met station just across the road. So that's a great advantage. And the irrigation events have to be entered manually and I've been doing that from the, um, from, uh, the irrigation system software. Also got soil probes in. There's four soil probes in around the, under the centre pivots. There's been a few issues with them so they're not all working as well as we'd like and that's, you've got a few, that's working away to get that sorted. Here's one of them. Um, that, well, that's what they look like. That's actually not the probe. The probe's buried in the ground down here at different depths. That's up a, on a stake. That's the telemetry um, that sends it away to the computer so we can look on the computer and see what's going on. Erie Pasture is giving us an idea of the water balance over the farm. This is giving a shot, uh, a picture of what's happening in the soil at a given spot, of what's going on below the ground. You can see that this got ups and downs just like the Erie Pasture. Biggest difference is you'll notice there's no peaks at the top. They're flattened. Reason is the water balance says there's lots of water coming in from the irrigation and the rain that we've had. The soil, the RAW in the soil, is only a certain capacity. Once it's full, it might keep putting the water on, but it just runs away, it either runs through or runs off. So the soil profile says, I can't take any more. I'm flat. And if it's flat, that means it's saturated and means the pasture's not growing. If that's irrigation doing that, we can control that a bit. If it's rainfall, we can't do anything about it. We just gotta let it drain off. And a fair bit of it was rain. You can see this is the 1st of January um, when we had the big rains, 1st of January 2020, and uh, that kept things a bit flat. So the pictures complement each other. The Erie pasture gives us the water balance. This gives us what's happening with the bucket in our soil. Um, and uh, with that info, Matt is, help, is um, using that to make his irrigation decisions. And that's what we're trying to uh, see how, how it develops. This is a, another one, that, a tool that we use that is free. That's Swan Systems. They are a company, but you can su subscribe for free to get this email every day. 
need to set up on your computer. Matt gets it coming to his phone every day so he can look in the morning and so, so do a couple of our reference group people. All that information in Erie Pasture and on the soil probe is telling us what's already happened up to a certain point. This is giving us a forecast of what's likely to happen in the next few days. And for irrigation scheduling, that's the money ball. The crystal ball that gives you a good um, understanding so you can then plan your irrigation events. And at least the experience of our team here is that this is quite an accurate prediction. There are other sources of this information that uh, some of our people have been using and it's not as good as this. So we're getting a, a fair degree of confidence that these forecasts, they give a rain range and they give a, uh, a, uh, ETO, a ETO estimate and those figures that total for the next few days, they're looking pretty good. And for a free bit of information, that's not bad. And I really encourage you to get onto that. This is also the stuff that we're doing on this project. AgSense is the valley system software where I've been extracting the water use info. And they've got that for all three pivots. There's pasture IO to try to monitor the pasture. And Peter Beale will tell us a little bit more about that. Dry matter measurements have been taken. Dave Dean with LLS um, has been out taking measurements using several means, CDAX, which will show you up the paddock, a plate metre, rising plate metre, and manual cuts using a quad. That's a quad there. Um, to try to validate what's happening with the pasture growth and give us an idea of whether we're doing better or worse. We're also measuring the water use. That comes some of it from AgSense, some of it from the water metre readings. The three pivots have one pump site and one metre that we can measure the water from. It's only used on the pivot, so we, we're getting that. Rainfall extracted from Miri Pasture or the bomb site, and we're using water prices from a nearby farm, because uh, you'll hate this, but the, being DPI, they don't get charged for the water, so we, we want to charge it properly. But we get the information, and then we get the energy measured from the power bills. So there's the, the power bills. Tells you the amount of energy and tells you the cost. So we're monitoring all of those things. And here's a bit of what we got. I should go back a step. We also um, evaluated ir irrigation systems a couple of years ago, so we know what the systems are doing. And the pivots are pretty new, so this is what happened when they went in. Uh, for each of the pivots, uh, I actually did the evaluations. The pump efficiency is down a bit, especially on that one. Not a fair, the benchmark is about 75%, 70 to 75. It's not a really a fair thing to say that because the, the whole system is designed to maybe have all three operating at once. I op, they're all operating one at a time when I did it. So it's perhaps not a fair comparison. If they're operating together, the efficiency is bound to be better. How uniform they are, two measures of how uniform they are. If it's 100%, it's dead even, beautifully uniform. As it goes lower than that, it means it's less uniform. The benchmarks, realistic benchmarks, are 85% and 80%. The ideal benchmarks are 90% for both. These aren't bad. Um, the uniformities are getting up there. This one is uh, one that I found over the years to be quite an issue. Control panel, most of them have got electronic panels. You dial in, I want to put on 15 millimetres. Go out there, test it with the catch cans, which we did to see what's going on they're very often not the same, and they can be quite significantly different. Most commonly I find them to be 20 to 30% less in the field compared to what the control panel says. These control panels, pretty good. You can see they're within Cooey. Be nice if it's plus or minus 5%, that's a little bit more than we want, but in the relative terms, that's really good. It's not normally a chop and change, Rob, so the question was, is that a, a calibration issue with the panels? I think the panels are calibrated from the sprinkler charts that come from yeah. the manufacturers. Yeah. And most of the systems I've measured have been new or almost new, so there hasn't been much change to the sprinkler package. Yeah, they, they haven't done that. It's just that the calibration from the sprinkler manufacturers, they will tell you, is a, an approximation. Yeah. The only way to know what's really happening is to do a catch can test. But they don't do it. Unless it's done, you think water's coming out, I'm putting 15 on, I might only put in, be putting 12 or 10, in which case you're under-irrigating every time you put water on. And that, to me, is a significant issue that is rarely addressed. Uh, these are pretty good. 
This is a, a term called system capacity, and I think um, James will tell us a little bit more about it too. This is the ability of the system to keep up with the crop water use at peak times. And this is really important because it's very often where irrigation systems have a big problem. It's simply the relationship of the flow rate going onto the field and the irrigable area. If the flow rate's down, you've got a problem. Most of the time, the flow rate's fine. You've got pumps that do their performance. Usually, if it's a problem, if it's too low, the irrigable area is too big because most farmers want to irrigate as much as they can. But you're actually shooting yourself in the foot because if you've got it too low, you can never keep up with the crop in the really heavy times. And uh, you're losing production and you don't know why. That's a big issue. These pivots have been very well designed because they've got system capacities of that region and the crucial thing you're comparing it to is the peak crop water use. And it's about eight millimetres a day for the pasture-based stuff here. So we've got plenty of system capacity. And you might have noticed on the era pasture graph where we had the dips below the refill point. When Matt hooked into it with the irrigation, he was correcting that, getting it up into the RAW fairly readily. And it's because he's got plenty of system capacity. If you haven't got the system capacity that goes down there, you're stuck. And James will tell us a bit more about it. That's the term green drought. So this setup is actually quite good. And it means if something goes wrong too, something breaks, then you're in trouble. We've got some metrics. And uh, these are the standard metrics we're doing across all 10 sites. Um, notice here it's just January, February of last year because that's when we were trying to get enough, uh, get the uh, accuracy in the information, and we only got decent figures around about then. You'll also notice that that's problematic, as I said, 2019 up to the end of December, early January was one of the worst seasons you'll ever get. Dreadfully dry, then the rain started, and it didn't just dribble, it seemed it came on hard. So we've got this in the wet part. So it's not the best set of metrics, simply because of the uh, great contrast of the season. But this is what we've got. Dry matter production over that two month period, about three, nearly three tonnes of dry matter per hectare, with a growth rate of about 51 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day. The water use, irrigation use is way down because there was plenty of rain. There's the rain there. So total water use in those two months was about 4.7 megalitres per hectare. We can cost that out, which we've done. This is a really crucial figure. You may never have seen that before, but we'd like you to get used to that kind of terminology. It's the efficiency of using your water. That term is gross production water use index. Dreadful term, but that's taking into account the amount of pasture you've got off all the water you've been able to put on by rainfall or irrigation. 0.71 tonnes of dry matter per megalitre is what this system did in January, February 2020, which you'll see is, uh, is not bad. If you're measuring that, you know how well you're getting the bang for your buck out of your irrigation and the rain you've got. If it's way down, room to, you've got room to improve. If it's way up, well, you're beating it by a mile. And that means you're doing a very good job. You've got an estimate of runoff. <coughs> Sorry again? You've got an estimate of runoff. Uh, I haven't measured it, but there was a fair bit, yep. So there's some, definitely that could improve if we didn't have the runoff from the rain, yep. So that question was, was there an estimate of runoff of the water that, excess water that came from the rainfall? Because that's lost, but we've, we've sort of counted it in the rainfall figures. So that it would um, get better if we had lesser rain. We've also got these figures of energy use uh, from the power bills. And you can work the absolute kilowatt hours, you can work it out kilowatt hours per megalitre of water pumped, and you can put kilowatt hours per tonne of dry matter. It also says then how well are you using your energy to get your dry matter. The energy costs are there that we've, we've costed out. Um, and in this farm, the overall cost for the January, February period, I should say this is for the, no, it's for all three pivots, my apologies, I was gonna say it just for one about $72 per megalitre pumped. Now, it's a fair bit of cost of water, but if you've got higher pressures and so on, it'll be more than that. 
This is a key figure here though, another one you, you probably haven't used. It's kilowatt hours per megalitre, per metre of hair. We've got kilowatt hours per megalitre up here, so you can work out what your running costs are. But if you do it per metre head, and head is the pressure that the system is operating at, and you can express it in kilopascals or PSI or metres of head. It's a technical term, but by getting it down to that, you can compare what's happening with different irrigation systems, how well you're using your energy. And that, again, is a good figure. It's in the, nicely in the range that we should have. There's many that are much worse than that. And then, of course, we can do a cost on that as well, which for, only for the irrigation water. There are our baseline metrics. We'll be taking measures of those each season to see how we're going, see whether we're improving. So the, the, can you just step back for that? Sure. So the, the $72 per megalitre pump. Uh, this one here. Yeah, that, that is, is that um, just on the additional grass grown from irrigation, or is that on the total grass grown in the paddock? That's the... That's the cost of the water used for irrigation on, in January, February on the field. So all the water that's pumped for irrigation, that's the cost of it overall. So that's actually, if you look at um, um, three quarters of the um, grove came out of rainfall. Yep. Um, are you saying that, that um, that three quarters that came out of rainfall, is that included in that seventy? No, dollars? not at all. That's just the cost of pumping the water. So when you do turn the pump on, it's going to cost you about 72 bucks a meg to pump it. In that season, the overall cost, the total cost, was not very much because we had a heap of rain. But if it was a dry season, if we had the few months before it, the actual total cost would have been huge, but the cost per megalitre would have been the same. That's not bad because the pump efficiency isn't too bad. If you've got really poor pump efficiency, and I've measured plenty at 50, 55%, the cost per megalitre, the water would be pumped all right, but it cost you a fortune to get it there. Okay? So it's a reflection of pump efficiency. It's also a reflection of the pressure that the system's using. Centre pivots are generally relatively low pressure. If you were putting that same water through that big gun traveller out there, it'd be a heck of a lot more, because pressure is what costs money. Okay? Your question applies to the line above, I think, Yeah, yeah. The $23. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, I think, I think yeah, if, I, if I heard you right, it was, the question was whether that $23 is for the total dry matter produced or just the dry matter produced from irrigation with the rain, right? The three uh, quarters of the water came from rainfall. No, well, it's actually unrelated to the dry matter. Oh, sorry, the 23. My apologies, I'm looking at this one. That's the one you want there. Yeah, sorry. That's the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't remember. Can't remember. Question on those. Yes, I can't remember what I put into that. Sorry, I was answering the wrong question. Oh, so, <laughs> in a drought, it costs about $80 a ton of dry matter. If we didn't have any rain... That's right. Exactly. That's it, yeah. Yep. But the question is, is it energy plus water, or is it just energy? That's just energy. The water costs it to the left. Yeah, there's the water cost there. So don't add them together. I mean, add $4.23 to $23 and there's the cost of water and energy. Yeah. So it's giving you a breakdown, which is part of what we're trying to do. So you can analyse the components of how you're going. So they're, they're a good set of metrics. And the, the thing about these metrics are it's not hard to get the base information to work out those metrics. So we'd really like everyone to adopt this because it's not research level stuff. You don't have to be a great scientist or whatever. You, the information you are probably already getting, you, you'll be able to work out those sort of figures. Okay? And it gives you a good indication of how you're going with your irrigation. That applies, can apply to any irrigation system you want. Obviously we're applying it to pasture. You can put it onto crops, whatever you like. Um, that will work. Something that the Tasmanian Institute of Ag also did as part of the project was do some modelled potential yield. Um, and for this site, using historical weather data and some assumed conditions such as fertiliser applied, 
of 250 kilograms per year per hectare per year on a monthly basis, an irrigation application of seven megalitres per year based on average rainfall. The potential yield here is 16 tonnes of dry matter per hectare per year. Now we got 2.9 in two months, so we're not, we're about right if we could get that going through the whole year. We haven't got all the figures to really validate that yet. We hope we will now. Um, next time we get it, we hopefully we'll have figures that might relate to that. We do have this one, the gross production water use index of about 0.9 tonnes of dry matter per megalitre. Ours here was 0.71. Again, there's a few assumptions in there and I reckon we'll get up to that and maybe beat it. No, no, it's modelled on your annual... And you're right. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, right. That's right. So it's not including like if we've got a couple of money in the mix. Oh, no, it's not, Mark. No. That yep. one was just your pasture system. Yeah, we left the maize out of it. So it's based on, based on rye. Yep. But we can do it for maize. Yeah. If we've done it somewhere else, so I think we can do that as well. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> I'm quite sure I used to. You could get high units if you put nitrogen up. Um, I think you'd be my observation. Well, I think we had a little bit of suppressed, in some cases, suppressed yield because of the heavy rain that came in January too. I'm not sure whether we, it just, just the season was so dramatically opposite. And I this was just a modelling exercise. Yes. You should stress. Oh yeah, it's to just give a baseline to compare to yeah, the modelling. Yeah, that, that was no real data. No, no, well, it was data, but. The idea is to say, here's model data, yeah. let's see what we've got on the field. That, that was more regional, if anything, wasn't yeah, it? Like a lot, that's lot, right. lot came from what lower Hunter district could potentially... I was done for here with the weather, what would be here, yeah. but it's, it is a model thing generalised over long-term data. In terms of the energy, that kilowatt hours per megalitre and metre head, there's two uh, benchmarks we can use. These guys did a general one, four to eight, and we were four point one or something. Uh, another guy who's a specialist pump um, man, he, he, his range is that, so we're really bang in the middle of his range too. So that's good, it's telling us that our, uh, our energy usage is in a very good range, uh, judging by the benchmarks. And in terms of the project, we'd love you to keep informed. Um, I do a monthly irrigation report, although I do apologise, I haven't got the one done for February, I was hoping to. Um, and that goes out to our reference group. I'm happy to send that out to anyone who would like it. So if you would like to be on the mailing list, please let me know. We put updates out in these um, media, Dairy Snapshot, New South Wales, Dairy New South Wales, Dairy Droppings and Milk Flow, and others if we can. Carly's great at getting stuff out, so is Sheena. Um, would you like to get the Swan Systems daily email? Not hard to get onto that, we can show you how. And be set up on every pasture, which we said is free. In the next major thing I want to do is have a workshop in the cooler months where we'll do these, a few of these things, look at irrigation system selection and power, water meters, and get you set up on Ira Pasture. So if you want to come along, we'll go through the whole, just the mechanics of getting you set up, if you'd like to do that. There are some other uh, podcasts and webinars that have been done over the last year in particular during COVID. Uh, and Marguerite is mainly responsible for those. They're available on the website. Um, that's the that's the dirty long web address. You never remember that, but this is this is Marguerite's suggestion. Just get on the Dairy Australia site and search for smarter irrigation. And you're bound to find it somewhere. And I think that's all I've got to say. There's my details if you want them. Any questions or comments on that fairly quick go through of what we've been doing over the last uh, year or two? Uh, that's excellent information. One of the things there on that you had the um, uh, capacity uh, system capacity system capacity figure. Yep. Like one, one of the critical issues, and we're beat just now, not there. One of the most critical issues is cost of power. Yep. And um, system designs really need to be looking at um, uh, being able to operate on off-peak power. Uh, not so that 
So I'm guessing that you're talking about a system design there working on um, ability to pump 24 hours a day. Exactly. Um, so when you're looking at system capacity, it's probably important that the, you take into account just where, you, where you're sourcing your power from and, and what those yes. implications are. And if you're in a system where you can't get um, a flat rate and you, you can go off peak or peak, your system capacity needs to be possible. Particularly if you're starting with a new system, yep. you need to be able to um, have a system capacity that works around I'll say yes and a no on that because you can easily shoot yourself in the foot uh, on two counts. The, that is you're absolutely right, it's a 24 hour uh, system capacity. Uh, most systems in reality you've got to modify it by the management of the farm so it does get modified. But if you just go with off peak you reduce the costs but to increase the system capacity increases the cost of the system. So the extra capital cost that you have and the operating cost, because it'll up the pressure, might negate the gains you're getting in your power. And perhaps more importantly, if you restrict your irrigation to off-peak times only, you may well be underwatering your crop or not getting it at the right time, which means you'll lose a lot of production, which might also cost you more than you're gaining in the off-peak power. And I'd say that our soils here too is when you can actually physically Sort of take, that, take that much water. water yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. In, in that restricted time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know any client base that doesn't water through the day. If I didn't water through the day, it wouldn't happen. Yep. It's just not realistic to get around your farm. You know, people would love to think about it, but if you've got an average that's cost out, it's just. Yeah. Well, we, we wouldn't irrigate at in the day at all. We don't. We don't yeah. irrigate at night. Every, and, and, and all of our systems are designed that way. Yeah. Because it's the, the power paying 14 cents a kilowatt rather than 28. Like you can't, I can't see how you can actually justify the area after that. Peaks 50 or something. So it's, yeah. Well, it might be, yeah, yeah, yeah some uh, spots. Well, okay. can, can I, the, with that, can I, I actually make some comment on that? Oh, my talk will come up to it, but okay. certainly we've done a lot of um, calculations around system capacity and power use. Um, for systems and what we've been able to demonstrate, and we've done that in Queensland, we've done it in Tassie, is that the smaller system capacity designed for what is your peak water use, operated 24 hours a day is often cheaper than a bigger system capacity operated in off peak. And we've done it again and again, we've got plenty of case studies to demonstrate that and we can go through that a little bit later on. So there's a lot of, there's no clear answer as to what is right and what is wrong. It depends very much on your system and on what your risk profiles are. But we can chat a bit about that a bit later. Yes. I think I, I just reinforced that last comment of James. Uh, it might be working great for Christoph's situation, but it might be actually dreadful for some other body else's situation. So it's a case by case situation and the numbers should be worked out. So I, I take your point, but I wouldn't take it as a, a big general principle to apply because you can definitely shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments on that? All right, well, I'll... I, mean, Sorry, I, mean, yeah, I was just going to say <coughs> that while this is a flood for the dairy, I'm also in big production, and I find that the, the processes which you're asked to look at is just as relevant to our beef operation, mm -hmm. and I think it's really excellent because there hasn't been any, you know, for, for general irrigation, there hasn't been any, you know, it's been a long time since we've had a dairy, since we've had an irrigation officer, in the DPI getting sent the information. Yep. So I think it's absolutely fantastic that, that this, this is there, giving us all with the big you know, turf, veggies, beef, dairy. It's great that this information's out there. Great. Yeah, thanks. All right. Well, I'll, I'll say I'm done. And Matt is going to give us a few minutes of um, the experience of the sort of things we've been talking about here on Tokel from his point of view as the farm manager, the irrigation manager. In other words, we're going to get the real perspective here. <laughs>